in terms of what we're hoping that you guys will take away from this. So let's get into it then. Next slide, please. Thank you. Adjusting to unique stressful times. So according to the APA, American Psychiatric Association, the definition of adjustment disorder is the presence of emotional or behavioral symptoms in response to an identifiable stressor or stressors occurring within three months of the onset of those stressors. So many of us were stressed before COVID-19, just with our regular lives, everything that we had to do, add on a global pandemic that shuts down everything and changes our whole way of doing things. Now our stress levels have increased. If Probably we even thought that was possible, but most of us would probably say they have increased. And so trying to adjust to these uniquely stressful times can be really, really hard, even on a good day, even for those of us that have been really good prior to a pandemic. Most of us have never lived through anything like this. So this requires really good, intentional, proper self-care. And so again, our hope is that by the end of this session with us, you will feel that you have at least a roadmap for how you can do that and some real practical takeaway tips for how you can implement this into your own life. So moving on, what are some potential stressors for us at this point? Well, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was the fear of getting COVID-19. I think we were all trying to figure out how to do this, what to do, what not to do. And so that fear of contracting it, of someone you love contracting it, and what would it mean? A major, major stressor for many folks. Now that we're coming, I'll say maybe towards the end of this, shortage of vaccines. Now folks are trying, the folks that want to get vaccinated are looking for vaccines and we're trying to find them. And so I don't know about you guys, but I know even in my own practice, I've had clients that have come in and been stressing and stressed about, I want the vaccine, I'm trying to find the vaccine, I can't get it anywhere. So just the stress of trying to even stay safe in the midst of this pandemic. And then the lack of consistent information. I think one of the things that has been really challenging through this whole time for all of us is how frequently things have changed in terms of what we need to be doing, what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing. And so just trying to stay up on top of all of the, the protocols and what you need to know and how you need to do things has been stressful in itself. And then another big one for many of us is financial loss. Whether you've had to take a pay cut, you've had to cut your hours, or if you're a small business owner, you've lost business revenue because of this, you've had to shut down. It has done a tremendous, tremendous blow to our finances. If you have children that are of, maybe before preschool age and you've had to think about daycare and what does that do because now daycares weren't open. So lots of us have had financial stressors in a variety of ways throughout this time frame. And now with us trying to get back into some sort of normalcy, I don't know about you, Dr. Holly, but I'm also hearing a lot of clients starting to say they're a little concerned. They're afraid about socializing and getting back out there now because we've had a year of getting used to not having to socialize and not being around people. And now that the world is starting to open back up a little bit, it's it's scary to go back out there and know that there's still this, this green monster out there haunting us. So COVID-19 has been an overwhelming experience for many of us where we really don't know how to properly practice daily self-care in the midst of this. It's a very unique time. Again, most of us living have never experienced anything like this. And so how do you find your way to be intentional about your self-care. That's where we want you to be today. So we've talked about potential stressors. Now we're gonna talk about burnout in terms of what that is. Now that you know what some of the stressors are that most folks are likely dealing with, let's talk about how those start to impact you. So burnout is typically when we're overwhelmed and stressed is where we start to notice that those stressors are getting the better of us. But what is burnout? Burnout is a condition resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. It can be an internal struggle heightened by a perceived external barrier. So again, COVID-19 is a great example of that. The internal struggle for many of us, we were already stressed before this, but now we've got this bigger stressor that's external that we have little to no control over and that adds to the stress which leads to burnout. 
So burnout can look like you're physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually just exhausted. It's a breakdown of your body. You're tired. Maybe you notice you're getting sick more. You've got the sniffles. You just don't feel well overall, but there's nothing generally wrong with you. Burnout has a way of taking, showing us its toll physically in some of these areas, whether you're snappy with people in the emotional area, mentally, you're maybe just cloudy, foggy, you're not thinking as clearly as you normally do, and you've just lost all sense of joy in terms of that spiritual exhaustion. So that is what stressors can do when they start to take over your body. They turn into burnout. So once you know, I think I'm dealing with burnout, let's talk about what the types of burnout are in terms of where they can come from in your life and what that would look like. So for our intensive purposes here, we've only identified five areas, but I'm sure for most of you could say there are many other areas of stressors in your life that they may come from. But under these uniquely stressful times, we thought these five would be appropriate. So workload, again, many of us, because of pandemic, have had to completely change how and where we do our work. So you may be doing a little too much work, especially if you're working from home and your commute is from the living room couch to your kitchen table. Oh, it's okay if I work until seven. It's okay if I start at eight and I don't get done until six. It's fine. You may be working way more than what you would have ever worked if you went into your office like you normally did Monday through Friday, nine to five, eight to four, whatever the case may be. You're working from home now, which means for many of us, we often don't have enough resources to do our jobs the way we used to do. So not only are you working more hours, but you're working more hours without all of the resources that you normally would have, all of the supports that you would normally have. Workload can be a type of burnout. Control. Many of us, again, working from home, maybe you've got a manager, a supervisor, boss that is working remotely as well, and micromanaging may be coming into play. They're trying to make sure that they're controlling everything that's going on in your work world, in your house at this point, and that can be an issue. If you're the boss, like Dr. Holly and I, and you own your own business, then maybe you might be micromanaging yourself, depending on what's going on, and you're not giving yourself a break in terms of just giving yourself a time to let it go and step away from it. So the control factor, are you feeling like either you're being controlled too much by the powers that be, or are you the one that is controlling in terms of how you're managing either yourself or the others that work for you? Third, reward. This was an issue for most of us prior to pandemic, but even now it may be more so, because again, if you're working more hours than what you normally would, you're likely not getting enough pay for what you're doing. And you may also not be getting as much satisfaction from what you're doing, especially under the circumstances. If you've had a job where you're used to interacting with people, socializing, and now you're stuck on a phone or you're stuck doing Zoom, you may not feel that there's as much reward in the work that you're doing at this point, and it can lead to burnout. Community. This has been a big one in the midst of this pandemic, the isolation. So many of us have had to go through this pandemic isolating, socially distancing alone. And so that has meant a lot of stress and a lot of burnout. Haven't been able to see family and friends for over a year. Conflict, depending on where you live in the country, depending on what some of your uh, ideology ideologies are, you may have differences of opinions about what this pandemic has been. Is it real? Is it not? Do you wear a mask? Do you not wear a mask? Now is do you get the vaccine? Do you not get the vaccine? just going to the grocery store can lead to conflict. The disrespect, again, in the midst of all this conflict, many folks feel that they're being disrespected because their opinions, their perspectives are not being valued or highlighted by the rest of our society and community. So those three things in terms of how you interact with your community once you leave your home can lead to stress, which can lead to burnout. And then finally, fairness. Again, goes along with community, discrimination, microaggressions, favoritism, depending on where you fall on the spectrum of how you feel about this pandemic. You may feel that your particular perspective is getting not as much play as it needs to. Your particular position is not, not being financially supported as much as it needs to be. So discrimination, you can't go in a place because you don't want to wear a mask. Any of those things can lead to feelings of unfairness. It's not fair. It's not being equal. 
And under the circumstances of where we are now, that can lead to burnout because if you're experiencing that on a regular basis, that makes up a lot of stress, which leads to burnout. So those are the five types of areas of burnout that we felt were applicable to dealing with our uniquely stressful times now. The next thing that we're going to talk about are the signs of burnout so that you know what they look like once you start to experience them. So again, emotionally exhausted, you just have no joy. There's no get up and go in your spirit at this point. You are just blah, blah, You're like a gray wall of paint. You feel worn out. You have no energy. You don't want to go for a walk. You don't want to do anything but sit on the couch. Feeling overextended. Maybe you've got one too many Zoom invites that you've said yes to. Maybe you've said yes to too many projects at work and now you're feeling overwhelmed by how much you have to do. Feeling drained, feeling detached. I have no energy. I want to get up and do something. I want to get up and clean my house, but I'm just done. I'm exhausted. And then feeling detached, kind of not necessarily in the present moment. Everything is kind of, eh, yeah, 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 whatever. You're not necessarily attached to what's happening around you. And a lot of us have experienced cynicalism or negative attitudes towards customers, towards work. Maybe you noticed you're really short with your coworkers, with your bosses, with customers, because I'm just not, I'm not checked in at this point. These are all signs of burnout. Some other signs of burnout are also things like, <clears throat> next slide, Dr. Holly, please. Thank you, ma'am. Digestive problems. For those of you that have dealt with any type of anxiety, feeling nervous about something, you know you've had that feeling in your stomach where you're feeling nauseous, that upset stomach, gas, diarrhea, constipation, any of those digestive issues can be signs of burnout, especially when, again, you take them in connection with what we've been talking about. Altered appetite. For many of us during this pandemic, we've had an altered appetite. Maybe you've been eating too much. Maybe you've not been eating as much as you need to be eating. If you're like me, you've been eating a little too much and you've gained a few pounds in the past year or so, but it can be a sign of burnout because it's stress eating. We're worried. If you're not eating, you're not eating because you're stressed. You're worried. Our bodies take the toll of what we're worrying and stressing about. Maybe you're having sleep problems. Maybe you're sleeping too much or you're not feeling like you're getting enough sleep. You lay down and you wake up in the morning and you still feel unrested because it's been a very stressful sleep for you. You may be experiencing headaches. Oftentimes when you're overwhelmed and stressed out, you will experience headaches because your mind is racing and you've got all these things going on in there and it just can't seem to turn your brain off. Muscles, tensing, aches, pains, there's nothing wrong, you haven't fallen, you haven't hurt yourself, but your whole body just aches. You've got pains, your back aches, your legs ache, your knees ache. Increased heart rate, blood pressure. Oftentimes when we are feeling stressed and burnout, you will notice that your heart races. You've got higher blood pressure. If you monitor your blood pressure, you will notice that. It's your body's sign. It's just ways of letting you know there's something going on and we need to take, take time to pay attention to this. For men, you may notice things like low testosterone. Women, you may notice irregular menstrual cycles. It's either absent or it's painful or it's coming late or it's coming early in terms of your menstrual cycle. Burnout and stress have really, really funky ways of manifesting themselves in your body. And for men and women, it often impacts those sexual systems of the body. So low testosterone for men, again, women, irregular menstrual cycles. It can also mean things like reduced libido for both men and women. You may find that your sex drive has gone through the tanker. You just don't have the energy. I don't want to. I don't feel like it. Could be a sign of burnout for you. Hair loss. Men and women can definitely go through this when you're stressed out, overwhelmed, experiencing burnout. That can be one of the signs. If you're combing your hair, brushing your hair, and you're noticing there's clumps of it, there's strands of it coming out more so than usual, you may be experiencing a sign of burnout. Skin irritations. For anybody that deals with any type of skin irritation, eczema, dermatitis, psoriasis, you likely already know flare-ups come when you're overwhelmed, when you're stressed, 
there are also signs of burnout. When you're noticing that your eczema is really kicking up, flaring up, you may want to check in and see if you're stressed because that could be what's causing the flare up as opposed to anything else. And then on the mental aspect of that, the emotional aspect, it could be depressed. You could feel depressed. You could feel anxious. You may find that you're just jittery all the time. I can't sit still. I'm fidgeting. I don't know what to do with myself. Or you may feel depression. You may feel like there's no joy. You're just kind of lost your, your, your lust for living. And you're feeling like there's a bit of hopelessness going on in your life. Memory deficits. Again, when we are overwhelmed, I don't know about you, but I can't remember three things. So I often find that my memory is suffering and you may have told me something earlier today and by 12 o'clock, I've forgotten what you said. So memory deficits, you're not remembering things quite as crisply and as clearly as you used to. For many of us during the pandemic, excessive alcohol consumption. Maybe you normally would have a glass of wine a night or a drink a night, and now you're finding it's two or three glasses of wine or whatever the beverage is. Excessive alcohol consumption is another one that comes in here that we need to worry about in terms of just, again, paying attention to what are potential signs of burnout in your life that you may need to think about. So we've gone through the definition of burnout. We've talked about the types of burnout. Now we're going to talk, or look at rather, our first polling question in terms of giving you guys a chance to start trying to really incorporate all of this information. So our first polling question, which signs of burnout are you recognizing in yourself now? A, feeling emotionally exhausted, worn out, overextended, drained, detached. B, reduced libido or regular menstrual cycle, hair loss. C, skin irritations, eczema, dermatitis, psoriasis, depression or anxiety. For D, E, memory deficits, sleep problems. F, misuse of substances, alcohol consumption, etc. And then finally, digestive problems, altered appetite. Let's see what you guys think. And then we can have a little discussion and go from there about what are some of the biggest ones that you guys are dealing with. All right. So I can see the poll. I can't I can see, see the poll um, as well. Yeah, I don't know um, if anybody's answering just yet, but I can definitely see the poll question. So I think once the poll closes, we'll be able to see. Um, Hi, Dr. Holly. This is Dawn. That, that's correct. Nobody can see the answers until um, everyone has submitted their answers, and then we will uh, okay. publish the results to everyone. Okay, great. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. Now we know. We'll give about another minute for the poll. So if you haven't answered and you want to get your answers in, please do so now. So as you're thinking about what your answers are for this, you may have more than one. You may fall into several of these categories. So if you find that more than one is, is really calling out to you, what I would say is try to pick the one that feels the most relevant to you in the moment right now, even knowing that there may be some other ones on this list that you could say, yeah, I'm kind of dealing with that one too. But pick the one that you feel right now is the most pressing one that's dealing, that's bothering you or you're dealing with right now in terms of that. Okay, so it looks like we've got some results coming in here. So it looks like our top winner, make sure here, yep, looks like our top winner is feeling emotionally exhausted, worn out, overextended, drained, and detached. 
Yeah, we figured that kind of catch-all category might be one that most folks would feel is really resonating for them. Um, our second one looks like it is memory deficits and sleep problems. Again, not surprising for many of us dealing with the memory deficits, not being able to sleep, really big ones here. And then our third category would be depression or anxiety. Actually, I'm lying. No, no, sorry. no. It's the, di digestive, yeah, it's the digestive. Yep, problems. sorry. Digestive problems. Yep, sorry. Just look down. Digestive problems, altered appetite. So those top three, again, all of these, as you as you guys saw, based on everybody answering, I don't think there's one that didn't get at least one person saying that they were experiencing it. So as you guys see, for all of these signs of burnout, as long as you are starting to, we hope by the end of this, being able to one, recognize your signs of burnout, then from where we go from here, you will be able to start planning and doing some targeted, intentional, conscientious work for how you can develop a great targeted self-care plan. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Holly so that she can take us through the rest of this. Yes, thank you, Val. And thank you everyone who um, responded to the poll. Again, this is all anonymous and something that you just wanna be mindful of as we go through the presentation. Hopefully you're taking notes, right? So you can jot down and begin to gather some information as it relates personally to you. This is all individual based and again, anonymous. And we just appreciate you being interactive and sharing um, some of the things that you're struggling with and just being vulnerable with us today. So I'm going to talk about the PIMS model. So what I did was I decided that self-care needs to encompass the whole entire human being. And so the PIMS model really stands for your physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual and social self. So those are the five areas when we look at who we are and how we're made up as human beings, right? And so when we properly assess um, ourselves individually, when it um, comes to self-care, we wanna look at things that are, are applicable, that's direct, that will leave us recharged and rejuvenated. So that's how I coined the PIMS model so that it literally goes into or taps into these five areas. And so when you look at the PIMS model and look at self-care using this approach, it will help you minimize any challenges that you may have identifying proper self-care and behaviors, right, that may or may not be um, effective to what you need personally when it comes to maintaining your personal professional well-being. As we spoke about earlier, a lot of times we will do self-care acts, but it, they don't leave us rejuvenated and recharged. So when we look at targeted self-care, self-care is something that's always suggested when we're looking to handle any type of depletion or um, exhaustion um, or reduced energy or professional efficacy, right? So it's like, okay, I have to, you know, practice or do some type of self-care. Please note that self-care varies and looks different person to person. So no two people may um, practice this same type of self-care. So that's why it's very important that you identify individually what that looks like for you. It doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It doesn't have to be something that requires a lot of time either, okay? Self-care literally involves engaging and behaviors or activities that promote your health and well-being so that you feel be better physically and emotionally and just all the way around because not only do you want to feel better physically and emotionally you also want to look at those other areas which are your mental health your social self and your spiritual self now i'm going to break down what the assessment looks like so when you are assessing yourself in regards to what you need as far as self-care, we want to go through the five areas of the PIMS model. So first, we're going to look at your physical self. And the one of the things that you want to ask yourself is, am I eating healthy? Now, healthy is very subjective. What's healthy for you may not be healthy for me. I'm a low-carb eater, so I follow a keto diet. Me and Val joke about this all the time. She's not keto, so she'll eat my french fries. Um, Every you know, single like time. <laughs> <laughs> right? Now, that doesn't mean I won't eat a carb, right? But I'm just not, my diet is not composed of a lot of carbs. So for me, that's healthy. I drink 
at least 100 ounces of water a day. So again, what's healthy for you? You know what that looks like. So that's a question that you can ask to assess on a physical level when we look at targeted self-care using the PIMS model. Another question that you can ask yourself, am I moving or exercising regularly? I'm not talking about having a gym membership or going to Platinum Fitness and, you know, three times a week. I'm just asking, are you moving? A lot of our positions have become very sedentary. So, for example, I walk a lot. I love to walk, but because I have become very sedentary, I'm starting to have some joint issues. So, I'm making sure that I'm moving in between sessions. I'm stretching, right? I'm making sure that my exercise does pick up back again with just walking. So whatever exercise looks like to you or moving, are you doing that? So again, that's also subjective. Am I getting enough sleep? This can be subjective too. Based on the poll that we just did, some of you are not getting enough sleep. And so now with the pandemic, a lot of us have become insomniacs or we're oversleeping, right? So now can we reset our rhythm can we figure out what would be a good amount of sleep or am i just not again am i not getting it at all so these are some assessment questions that you can ask yourself on the physical level emotionally have i done something nice for myself this week something nice again is very subjective whether you did it today or you want to do it tomorrow it could just be buying a, a small bouquet of flowers, right? It could literally be giving yourself a compliment, but what have you done for yourself today, this week, right? That can give you an emotional boost. Have I told someone I love you today, this week? Whether it's your pet, your spouse, a family member, but sharing just having that emotional connection with another human being, have I done that? Have I practiced self-compassion today, this week? Am I ruminating over something? Am I beating myself up over something that is draining me emotionally that I need to really work through and then eventually let go? So we have to look at how we may be impacting our own selves emotionally. Mentally, am I practicing negative self-talk? This week, there are things that are going to happen that are out of our control, right? And they may impact us in various types of ways. So are we processing that in a negative way and then we continue to compound it? Or are we looking for a way to reframe it so that we can find out a solution, right? And work through it. Am I engaging in negative talk with others about me? You may have someone who may not be supportive of what it is that you're doing, right? But are you engaging in 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 a conversation with them about the things that are really beating you up and hammering and weighing you down, right? And it could be about anything. It could be about productivity. It could be about your weight. It could be about your children. It could be about anything. But we don't want to engage in that type of conversation and talk with others. Am I finding it hard to stop ruminating? Am I ruminating over things that, again, I can't control? Am I constantly thinking about something that I've yet to go to the other end of the spectrum? and figure out a solution. So there's nothing wrong with thinking about a problem, right? But we also have to find a solution. And so I like to kind of joke, and but in all seriousness and say that life is like math. For every problem you may have individually, there's always a solution. And so again, there's nothing wrong with thinking about the problem, right? And how to solve it, but we have to come up with a solution. Spiritually, did I practice gratitude today? With so much going on, I know last Friday I, I buried my grandmother. My husband had COVID. He was in a hospital literally 60 days ago. And I'm grateful just for the little things, believe it or not. And so I try to practice gratitude each day, even if it's just for the meal that I'm eating for that day. So are we practicing gratitude? Did you engage in something spiritual or religious today? Now, this is not anything related to a certain type of faith or anything like that, but just you connecting spiritually with yourself and your higher being, if you believe in that, but did you gauge in some type of spiritual connection? Third, did I help someone else in need today? There are others that are less fortunate for us and just helping them and extending that warm kindness, right? Can be a, another way to spiritually boost ourselves and help us shift from what's stressing us out and burning us out. 
Last, we look at the social aspects of ourselves. Again, we're going to assess. Did I reach out to family and friends today? Before my grandmother died, I literally texted her 48 hours prior to now, and we were going back and forth. And then that Saturday, she was gone. And so you never know, um, again, when someone is going to be in and out your life. So am I reaching out? Am I connecting, right? Even if it's just, again, a quick chat, a quick FaceTime, a quick text. Number two, did I take time to do nothing today for 15 or 20 minutes? Now, if you don't have 15 or 20 minutes, maybe you have five, maybe you have seven, but take time to just do nothing. And did you do that? Third, did I set a healthy boundary with social media and the news? And so socially, we want to be aware of what it is that we're also consuming, right? Because sometimes what we are consuming with the social medias, wherever you're on, or whatever you watch in the news or read or listen to, it may continue to compound the way you're feeling. Um, it may compound the burnout and the stress. Now, I want to focus on what untargeted self-care looks like. So we have patterns and we have blocks. So some of the patterns that all of us have fallen into, and I'm guilty of this as well, to say, hey, I'm going to get a pedicure and manicure, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm going to go and take a bubble bath, light some candles. Again, nothing wrong with that. Maybe I'll just binge watch, you know, three episodes, or maybe the whole entire series of Shit's Creek. Maybe I'll just scroll through Instagram mindlessly. Or maybe I won't even do anything because I feel so guilty if I were to take a break or practice any form of self-care. These patterns are something that a lot of us continue to do day in and day out when we're thinking of, okay, I need to practice self-care. Here's the deal. These patterns are not actually self-care. What they are are regular maintenance. Medicure, pedicure, manicure, a lot of us, we get those done every two weeks, right? Bubble baths, that's the part of hygiene. So that's something that you should regularly do, whether it's a bubble bath or a shower. Now, binge watching TV, there's nothing wrong with binge watching TV. However, it's something that you want to do in moderation. It's something that you want to be um, targeted as to what you watch so that it can go back to one of the areas of the PIMS model so you do feel rejuvenated and recharged. So for example, if I know that I'm down emotionally, like I said, I just lost my grandmother and I want to laugh, I'll go on Netflix and I'll find something that is funny, something comedic that will help me and lift my spirit. Well, I've been watching, no, but it'll do something that will help me shift, right? Social media, not mindlessly scrolling. No, that doesn't help or rejuvenate. Sometimes it makes me feel even worse. And so now we want to shift over to look at the blocks. A lot of times these areas is what keeps us locked into the patterns. So we'll say, okay, well, I don't have the time to really practice targeted self-care, but I do have the time to mindless scroll social media or binge watch TV that doesn't rejuvenate or recharge me. Or I have poor boundaries. I'm always saying yes when I should say no. I'm always saying no when I should say yes. And then I have poor self boundaries, which is boundaries that I need to in incorporate within myself. And we'll get into what that looks like and what that means later into the presentation or I have poor flexibility. I'm not open to change. I'm not open to doing something different that I know will be helpful for me. And again, I'm feeling guilty for taking a break or practicing self-care. And so these blocks keep us beholden into these patterns that are really between self-maintenance and something that just doesn't rejuvenate or recharges us in the end. So looking at our polling questions, after I broke down the patterns and the blockers, which ones are you currently experiencing? Pedicure, manicure, bubble baths, which is just your regular maintenance, binge watching TV or mindless scrolling that doesn't rejuvenate or recharge you? Are you feeling guilty for taking a break? Do you find that you like the time to properly incorporate targeted self-care or are you having some issues with setting boundaries?
All right, the polling question is currently in progress. We'll let that go for about a minute or two. And yes, you will maybe find that you do more or, you know, of these or maybe all five, but like Dr. Bob pointed out, just sit with what resonates with you today in the moment, or maybe something you did last night, right? But what's coming up for you right now as you um, answer or think about your answer to this poll question? All right, so it looks like the results are in and again, thank you all for answering and, and participating. So it looks like at number 1, we have binge watching TV or minus these growing social media. And then coming in 2nd, we have lack of time management and then our 3rd option or answer was feeling guilty for taking a break. They, again, thank you guys for, um, you know, answering and participating. Um, we're going to continue with the presentation to talk about how you'll be able to manage um, all of these areas, but specifically with the binge watching and um, managing your time and feeling guilty for taking breaks. And with that, Val, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we've talked about what untargeted self care is looking at it through the PEMS model. Now we're going to take you through what targeted self-care looks like using the PEMS model. And so just like Dr. Holly broke it down, going through all the letters of the PEMS model for untargeted self-care, we're gonna look at, or the assessment of tar untargeted self-care. Now we're gonna look at going through the PEMS model using that in terms of how you can start to structure and frame how this is gonna work for you in terms of doing your own assessment. So at the physical level, the first letter in this, the P, there are three things we thought you could look at in terms of areas for how you could try to start assessing this for yourself. One, have sex regularly with yourself or partner. Now you may say, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're even talking about this in a CU event. However, we are all sexual beings. We are all sexual beings. We all got here through our parents having sex. So we're all sexual beings. So having sex is a natural part of our existence as human beings. So having sex regularly, whether it's with your partner or with yourself, it doesn't matter, but you should do it. It releases feel-good endorphins. It relaxes you. For most folks, you get a good night's sleep after it's over, depending on what happens. So having sex regularly will help you to stay calm, will help you to feel good, will help you feel good about yourself, you feel sexy, all of those wonderful things. So check in on that physical level. Have you had sex regularly with yourself or your partner? If you've been isolating by yourself, you are your best friend right now. Have sex with yourself. Two, take time off consistently by unplugging from social media, and from work. As Dr. Holly said, we all are guilty of scrolling through social media at times. And sometimes it doesn't help us. It does make us make us feel worse. So make sure that you are consistently planning to unplug, put the phone down, get off all of your social media haunts, the Twitter, the TikToks, the whatever you're on, get off of it for a while, turn it off so that it's not the notifications are not coming up and you're not tempted to keep going and looking. Make sure you're consistently unplugging from social media. Make sure you are unplugging from work. 
again, I think this has been one where many of us have struggled with keeping a boundary here because we're working from home in so many instances. And you don't realize you put in nine hours, 10 hours in a day, when if you were at work by 4.30, 5 o'clock, you'd definitely be looking at the clock on, ooh, it's about time to go home. But now you are home. And so making sure that you are consciously, consistently unplugging from work. If your day is supposed to be done at five, you should be done at five. Maybe 5.30 is your cap at the latest, but it shouldn't be that you're still working at seven when your day typically will be done at 5.30. So making sure that you're taking time off consistently, unplugging from social media, from work. That also means if you've got vacation time, sick time, all those things that you've maybe been, especially in this past year, because where are we going? You're sitting on a little vacation time. Start thinking about consistently maybe taking off a Friday and giving yourself a long weekend. Every month you take a Friday off and you've got a nice long weekend. Consistently thinking about how you can unplug from work is a part of this physically targeted self-care. And then third, eating healthy food and moving your body regularly. As Dr. Holly said, again, this looks different for everybody. So what eating healthily looks like for me versus what eating healthily looks like for you, it varies. Although I love my carbs, I am with Dr. Holly. I get a walk in every day. I try to work out on a regular basis so that I can still stay healthy and so that I can eat my carbs when I go out with Dr. Holly because I know she's not going to eat them and I want to be able to do that. So it's how do you know what is good for your body in terms of making sure that you're feeding it fuel that makes it feel good and nourishes the body as opposed to weighing it down and making you feel heavy. Moving your body regularly. Again, as Dr. Holly said, this does not have to be about you going to the gym. This can be going for a walk as Dr. Holly and I do all the time. It could be putting on your favorite song and getting up and dancing for five or 10 minutes. It doesn't have to be anything choreographed. If you're like me, you've got two left feet. So if you're gonna get up and dance to a song, it's not gonna look that great, but I know I'm gonna feel better once it's over. So move your body regularly. Don't just stay on the couch. Your body needs to move. It needs to be able to get up and have some energy. Make sure that you're giving and creating the time and the space to recharge your physical body. The next part of this is looking at the E, the emotional part of this. How are you doing targeted self-care emotionally? So as Dr. Holly said, unfortunately she has just suffered a loss. And so part of this for her is how do I pull myself up out of that space? And for many of us over this time of this pandemic, we've lost loved ones. You don't wanna go out and watch a sad movie when you're already feeling sad. Watch a funny movie, watch something that will make you laugh. And as Dr. Holly said, do you need to dive in and watch it for eight, nine hours? No, not necessarily, but enough to give you a little boost of energy and say, okay, well, I had a good laugh. I feel a little better now. That's a good thing. Find or create, get into a new hobby. Maybe you've always been a kind of amateur cook, but you really like to do it and you want to step up your game. Find some more, compli more complex menus, recipes to try. Maybe you've always wanted to try to learn how to play an instrument. Well, the beauty of what's been happening nowadays in the midst of the pandemic, folks have figured out how we can teach you online, virtually, via Zoom, how to play an instrument. So find a new hobby. Maybe it's something simple in your house. Maybe it's gardening. Maybe, maybe if you're like me, folks send you all kinds of plants and seeds and you don't always get a chance to do anything with them, but you want to, get out and start doing some gardening. Find a new hobby. And number two, I know Dr. Holly and I both have talked about, we use this in our own private practices with our clients, but telling yourself you're amazing daily truly does work. And I've had clients laugh like, oh, are you kidding? Ah. But trust me, you should be your best and first cheerleader in this world. So if you can tell yourself every day how amazing you are, everybody else around you will start to see how amazing you are. When you start off telling yourself you're amazing, I guarantee you the first couple of times when you look in the mirror, you're like, oh, good morning, you're amazing. By the end of 30 days of telling yourself every day you're amazing, you're like, good morning, beautiful, you're amazing, let's go rock this day, we're gonna do this. Because you start to believe in yourself when you're telling yourself you're amazing, as opposed to having self-negative talk, we want you to have self-positive talk. 
We want it to be encouraging and uplifting and inspiring for you, as opposed to where many of us get stuck in there. Oh, I'm horrible. I'm worthless. I'm a failure. This is the complete opposite of that. Tell yourself you're amazing because you are. You are. Engage in some social justice work. Emotionally, we want to feel good. We want to feel like what we do matters. If you engage in some social justice work, you will feel like what you're doing matters. Find some place in your community that you can safely volunteer. Maybe there's someone you know in your community that might need some help and you can do some assisting for them. Find some ways to engage yourself in some sort of social justice work that feeds you emotionally, makes you feel good, lets you know that you're making a difference in the world, a positive difference in the world. Those three things, those three areas will help you emotionally in terms of planning and figuring out what targeted self-care looks like for you. The next area is mentally. So what does it look like in terms of mental targeted self-care? Well, this is what are you doing that's stimulating your brain? So if you like to paint, if you like to draw, start doing it. If you haven't picked it up in the past year because you've been so overwhelmed and so stressed by what's going on, re-engage with it. If you like to sing, maybe prior to this, you were in the choir at your church or your, your synagogue, rejoin. Find some ways that maybe you can do it on Zoom. I actually have a client where her... Her choir meets on Zoom. I'm not quite sure how that works, but they seem to make it work and they enjoy it. Find some ways to make it happen. If you truly like to sing and you can't find a way to make it happen with others, sing in your house, sing to your plants. Your plants will appreciate it. Sing to your pets. Your pets may look at you like you're a little crazy at first, but they will appreciate the attention. Sing to your plants. Garden. Go outside. Get your hands in the dirt. Feel the soil. Watch something grow. Plant something and watch it grow. Mentally, it will do you well to stimulate your brain. Journaling, therapy, asking and receiving help. Journaling is one that Dr. Holly and I both use in therapy a lot because it is a great way to mentally exercise all of the stuff that we carry around in our brains every day. And it gives us a safe place to throw it in and document what we're thinking about. If you're not in therapy and you're really feeling overwhelmed, experiencing stress and burnout from what's been happening, get involved with a therapist. Find someone that is qualified in your area that will be able to be a resource for you. Receiving and asking for help. I think this is probably one that all of us struggle with. And if you are in any type of human services, healthcare field, this is often one that we struggle with because we're the nurturers. We're the ones that take care of everybody else. And so for us to receive and ask for help is often really, really hard. But I got to tell you, mentally, if you can start doing this for yourself as part of your self-care, your targeted self-care, it will mean a world of difference. For those of us on here that self-identify as nurturers and we're the ones that everybody else comes to when they need something, I guarantee you, if you just try you just try to ask for help. If you receive help from someone, they will likely say, I'll do anything for you. You never ask, but you know, I'm here for you whenever you need me. I'm so glad you asked. Of course, I'll help you. Of course, I can do this for you. But we often assume that nobody else has the time to, to be there for us. Don't make that assumption. Take a chance. Reach out. Ask for help with something. Receive the help graciously when it comes back to you. And then the third one, relax, listen to music, read a book. Again, as Dr. Holly and I have said, it's, it's tuning out the social media, it's tuning out the, the news outlets, it's doing things that really bring you some joy mentally. So maybe relaxing for you is sitting out on your patio or on your back stoop and watching a sunset. Maybe it's listening to some music without the TV on and you're just getting into some tunes from your childhood, from your teenage years. Maybe if you're like me, you've got a ton of books that you haven't read and you keep walking by them and saying, oh, I got to read that book. Oh, I got to read that book. Oh, I'm going to read that book. Well, read a book. You don't have to read the whole thing in one setting. Read a page. Read one page a day. Read two pages a day. But take the time to mentally do something that you want to do for you that makes you feel good in the moment. That's the idea about this. 
if you can work these three areas of the mentally as of the mental aspect of targeted self care, you will find that some of that fogginess that we've talked about, the memory deficits, they will start to they will start to fade because you're doing things that feed your brain mentally and give it the outlets that it needs to relieve the stress. So the next part of this is the S, the spiritual part of targeted self care. So again. Dr. Holly and I are not looking for you guys to have to have a religious affiliation to do this, but most of us have some sort of sense of spirituality that we're hoping that you can tap into in order to do this part of targeted self-care. So meditate. If you've not gotten into meditation, it is truly a valuable exercise to get into. It is a wonderful way to not only calm your mind, but to calm your spirit. Truly taking, even as Dr. Holly said, if you don't have 10, 15 minutes, five minutes of a meditation routine will work wonders in terms of just calming you and centering you to go on throughout your day. If you believe in a higher power, praying is also one of those activities that for many folks gives them a sense of spiritual relief and, and support. The last one here I think is huge, forgiving yourself and others. As a therapist, I know I work with my clients a lot with just forgiving themselves and others that they feel have wronged them throughout their lives. If you can work at this in a conscientious way of forgiving yourself for all the times you think you failed, you didn't live up to your own standards, your own whatever that may be, to forgive yourself and to forgive others that have wronged you along the way. If you can relieve those burdens, your spirit will soar because then you can truly live and you can thrive and be a happy individual. Volunteering, again, spoke about it in reference to doing social justice work, but it can be anything. Maybe there is a soup kitchen near your home that you can volunteer at. And it doesn't have to be that you've got to physically go in if you're not comfortable doing that. Maybe you can go to the grocery store and buy some things that you can donate there. You can volunteer at a phone bank where you don't even have to leave your house. You can sit right at your phone in your home and volunteer. Find some organization, some causes that are relevant for you and spend some time volunteering. Giving back does a world of good to us. Spending time in nature, watching a sunrise or a sunset. If you have not taken a walk outside your house in the past 12, 13 months, I encourage you to do it. Get some fresh air, watch the sunset, watch the sunrise. They are still some of the most amazing, magnificent events that happen every day that are free for us to look at. Don't have to have a ticket. All you need to do is go outside your house and look. It is awe-inspiring if you get up early enough to watch a sunset. I mean, excuse me, a sunrise. It's absolutely amazing. Watch the colors in the sky. In your biggest, best paint box, there's never the colors that are in the sky when the sun rises. Take the time to appreciate that. Value that. Spiritually, it will do you some good. I promise you. The next part of this is the social aspect. So if you're going to do targeted self-care socially, you've got to be intentional about this. And again, we talked about this a little earlier, working so much, working more than what you need to. If you're going to do this well in terms of targeted self-care, you've got to look at taking vacations, staycation days. Again, I mentioned it earlier, maybe you plan that you're taking long weekends, so it's a Friday off or it's a Friday and a Monday. And in this day and age, staycations work just as well. You don't have to get up and go anywhere. You can stay home, cook with family and friends, set up a Zoom session, do something like that where you can meet with people and have a Zoom session and cook your family's favorite meals. Take lunch breaks, foster friendships. If you're working through the day, make sure you're intentional about taking that break. As Dr. Holly said, get up, stretch, get around, move around a little bit so your blood gets pumping. Foster friendships. We've been in isolation for a year. Reach out to people. Hey, how are you? What's going on? Spend time with family and learn to say no. This goes to the overextending yourself. If you're saying yes to lots of Zoom meetings and all of these things, and you know when you look at your calendar, there's 18 things on one day, you've got to learn to say no. Socially, it will free up time for you, and emotionally, you will feel better because you won't look at your calendar and be like, oh my gosh, I've got so much going on. You'll feel much better. Learning to say no will help you with your targeted self-care socially. 
And so now that we've gone through all of that, talked about what targeted self-care is, we're ready for our next polling question. So polling question number three, what area of targeted self-care do you need to focus on? And again, we wanna say thank you so much for your vulnerability and your willingness to share this with us during this time frame. Again, remember your answers are anonymous. We will not know who said what. And in the moment for today, you may say that all of these are areas of targeted self-care that you need to focus on. But for right now, for our purposes, focus on our answer with what's the one that's most pressing for you right now. Okay, we're going to leave this poll question up for about another minute. So if you haven't gotten your answer in yet, please do so now. Okay, so it looks like, um, ah, social is our number one here. Well, no, I'm sorry. I thought that was a 91, but it's not. I'm sorry. Our big one is 36. Here we go. Physical. So physical seems to be running number one right now. Number two is the mental aspect of targeted self-care. And then three would be emotional. Again, not surprising. I think for many of us, we've noticed the, the wear and tear of this past year or so on our physical bodies, whether you've gained some weight, you've lost some weight, et cetera. Emotionally, for both, for many of us, excuse me, yeah, that whole issue of the emotional and physical, emotional, physical, and mental aspects of this, excuse me, are truly overwhelming because they incorporate and encompass so much of our daily lives. If your body is run down and drained, you physically don't have the, the mental energy to do any of the other things that you need to be consciously and intentional, intentionally working on. So I want to thank everybody again for taking the time to answer the questions. And at this point, I'm going to turn us back over to Dr. Holly, and she's going to take us through the next section. Thank you, Dr. Val, for facilitating that question. And thank you all for, again, participating. So now we'll focus our um, our mind on incorporating targeted self care. Basically, looking at these seven areas. These seven areas are tying back to your physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, and social self. Self boundaries. So a lot of people say, "Oh, well." I don't know how to really set boundaries with others, or you do have great boundaries with others, but you have poor boundaries with yourself. So self boundaries is when you basically learn how to monitor your own behavior. And so you create like this healthy structure for your life so that overall it can just run smoother. You literally are identifying what's good for you and what is it. And so when you practice and implement self boundaries, this also helps you minimize your own internal stress. Self boundaries reinforce self love and self respect to a physically, emotional, mental, spiritual, and socially healthier you. And so, some examples of self boundaries include sticking to your schedule, not working past your hours. So, Let's break that down. If my schedule is from 7.30 to 3.30, I'm gonna do my work within those hours, right? Now, if you find that your supervisor is calling you or emailing you at five o'clock, don't return the email, don't answer the call because you are breaking the self boundary and you are allowing your supervisor to not respect your boundary. Now, if you're the type of professional who is on call, that's something different, but I'm speaking to someone or a professional who has a set amount of hours 
eight hours, 12 hours, whatever that shift is, you stick to that schedule and do not work past that. I promise you, if you live to see the next day, the work that you didn't complete that day will definitely be there tomorrow. So again, when we practice self boundaries, we are also teaching others how to treat us in turn. But if we have poor self boundaries, people can always push the fence and not respect our boundaries, right? And then we become angry, we become resentful with ourselves the most and then the other person for not being respectful. But how do they know how to respect what our boundaries are if we don't show them, right? Number two, as therapists, Val and I, we always do our notes before or after sessions. So if you're in class and you're taking notes, jot those notes down, whatever's on your brain at the time, do them before class or after class. Whatever it is that you need to do before or after, literally, and whatever it is that your profession is, get it done so that, again, it doesn't linger, right? Because sometimes we can procrastinate or we're all over the place and then we're not organized. And so that can hurt us as well. Three, decide not to be around people who are hurtful or stress you out. Again, you don't have to say yes to family members or friends who are draining you mentally and emotionally or who are just not going to lift you up socially. You can say no. You don't have to take the phone call. You can always, you know, return the phone call with a text to say like, hey, you're in the middle of something. You'll get back to them at another time. But you have to be able to say no or yes to things that, again, will in return, create a healthier you around the, around the five areas of the PIMS model. So number two is setting a daily routine. Now, because of the pandemic and a lot of us working from home and so some of us are shifting back full time into the workplace or working with a hybrid model, our routines, our schedules have been totally thrown off. So what we're suggesting and we're looking at getting ourselves together mentally, right? and physically and emotionally together, you want to create some type of daily or weekly schedule. So if you have a profession where your schedule changes every week, then you want to be on top of that and creating their routine. If you are the type of person who has to create a daily schedule, because again, your schedule is always ever changing, the point of it here is that you want to create some type of routine. So if tomorrow is going to look different than from today, I need to literally check in some time before I go to sleep to iron out the things I need to do within that eight or 12 hour window so that when I wake up, I can ease myself into that, that daily schedule or that routine and I'm staying on track. Which leads into my second point of creating a calendar of, of activities. So these activities can be around your work. It could be around your productivity, or it just could be around connecting with other people in some type of way. Because of the pandemic, we have not had those deeper connections that we were used to always bringing in, but I'm challenging you and inviting you to really put those activities back in in some type of way. Um, at least once a month, Val and I, you know, we connect, we go out for food, right? Because that's something that allows us not only to connect, but to rejuvenate and recharge, right? For those of you who were having issues with sleeping and eating, now this is something that is not going to be, you know, an overnight fix, but again, creating an eating and sleeping schedule. I practice intermittent fasting. So for me, my feast hours are literally after five because I like to, you know, um, top heavy my day, get things done. If I eat a heavy breakfast or even lunch, I'm very sluggish. So that doesn't work for me. By 8.30, I'm in the bed. I'm not necessarily asleep, but I'm letting my mind and my body know that we are going to now get ready to turn down. And so at some point, I'm probably dozing off at like 9, 9.15. But again, you have to put your physical body and your mind into whatever that routine or that schedule is. And before you go to bed, take a couple of minutes to think about anything that you would, you know, um, like to achieve when you wake up the next day. So tomorrow's Thursday. Before you wake up, I don't know if you wake up to an alarm clock or your cat or your dog, you know, tickling you. But before you get out of bed, move very slow and just think about, okay, do I need to snooze for like another 10 minutes? Do I need to read this last page of this book? Do I need to write down a couple things that I totally forgot that I need to add it to my schedule. But don't just hop out of bed, right? And just start 
going into the race. Be very slow, move very intentional, because a lot of times when we don't do that, we are very haywire and our mind goes into 50 different places while our body is trying to catch up to where all these areas of where our mind is going. Last but not least, and we talked about this, but I want to reiterate it, take many breaks. You have to pause between tasks. So for me, prior to this, I would commute onto the train, into the office, and then that would be my transition to kind of catch up on a book that I'm reading. And then when I get into the office, I'm ready to see clients. I'm prepared. Now, when I'm leaving the office, I'm back on the train. I don't necessarily have to return to the book, but I may listen to some tunes to kind of get me prepared into now coming home and being mommy, right? And showing up for my children. But be in between each task, whatever it is. So if you're not transitioning, um, that can really jam you up because you're not allowing your mind to really dump from the previous activity. You're probably still ruminating, oh my gosh, I need to do that and that, add that. You want to take those thoughts and either write them down or do them and close them up so that you can take a mini break, a real mini break, to allow yourself to decompress mentally and physically before you hop into the next task. Turn off. Majority of us are working from home or again, we're working in a hybrid model. And so if you again are working more than usual, you have to be able to turn off your phone or your computer. I know that it's a struggle. I know that it's hard, but think about it. It's a way of setting a self boundary. It's a way of also setting an external boundary with work with yourself. If you were not doing this prior to the pandemic, meaning you were re leaving work on time, you were not answering emails and calls after work, just because you're home doesn't mean that you should be accessible. You should be accessible during your work hours and that is it. We all deserve to take a break. We all deserve to rest, right? And we don't deserve to be overworked or overextended. And part of that does fall onto you and I shoulders. So we have to be responsible in that regard of shutting off, turning off our phones and our computers. Again, setting boundaries with your employer, even if that means you, and not overworking yourself because I promise you the work will be there tomorrow. Shutting down. Now I talked about before you get out of bed. Now, before you go to bed, Take a couple minutes, do some deep breathing, right? Think about something relaxed and peaceful that may have happened during the day or even a day before, but just allow yourself to kind of go there for a moment. You could turn on some soothing music, whatever music that makes you feel very relaxed and feel very good. Um, I love candles. I love scents. I have a diffuser. You know, I use a lot of essential oils, right? Doing my deep breathing and exercising. Sometimes I'll, I'll journal. Um, but during this time of shutting down before you go to bed, no electronics. This is a time for resetting and restoring. Again, you don't necessarily have to turn off your phone. You could put it on do not disturb. You can put it on silent, but there should be no electronics before you go to bed. If you have children, check in with your children. Ask them about their day. Everybody kind of, again, just get together, connect, because they're probably in Zoom school, like most children, right? And they may want to have that connection, and it could be a part of your shutting down routine. Cut on, hug up with your pet if you have a pet, right? But you wanna create some type of shutting down routine that does not include electronics, but really allows you to really calm and reset and restore. Create positive experiences. Because of the pandemic, it has been really, really hard um, to move about, do things in our normal way that we would usually do. However, a lot of us have begun to become creative. Some of the states and cities and you know, have opened up and allowed us to reconnect um, again. But if you're living in a space where you can't really connect how you used to, again, schedule FaceTime with your family, your friends, and your coworkers, right? Um, reconnect with people who you haven't heard from in a while, or you can go on LinkedIn and join some professional groups to connect and meet new people that you've never ever met before, but there's something socially there that you would like to connect and have that extension. Um, again, just to feel alive and have that human connection. 
but you want to be able to set aside time for you to really build a connection laugh with people catch up and try as much as you can to not talk about the pandemic because we want to create positive experiences right and as much as you can you want to move your body um so that this can help you decrease stress hormones. So again, it doesn't necessarily have to be the gym, but in some type of way, just being in tune and moving with your body. Some people like to do um, yoga or tai, uh, tai Chi or Pilates. There you go, right? Some people are into karate or martial arts or kickboxing, but just different things that can, uh, again, help you decrease and manage your stress hormones. Be cautious and not fearful. So a lot of people always ask, well, what does that mean? Since the pandemic, a lot of people have really, really isolated and shut themselves down and out from the world and not have allowed themselves to engage and even in a safe way. They have not came um, from out of their home, have not left their home. And so I would just encourage you that you want to be cautious. And what that looks like is you want to wash your hands. You want to practice social distancing. You want to wear your mask. Whether you're for or against the vaccine, that is your choice. But we want to be cautious and making sure that we're practicing um, safety measures around a pandemic as much as we can, but not be in a fearful space that you're not allowing yourself to live life and be present, right? The pandemic is not going to last forever. And so when we are living in a fearful place, a lot of times this is brought on by overconsumption of the of the social media, things that we see there or the news coverage on a pandemic. Now we're focusing on reopening the Johnson and Johnson vaccine no longer um, working or being available, right? A shortage when they're going to open it up for the 18 and younger population. So it's so much going on when we we want to be aware, we want to be cautious, but we don't want to be, again, in the overconsumption of things that we cannot control because those things will keep us anxious in a fearful place and will, within return, will impact us emotionally, mentally, and physically. If you find that you're not able to implement any of these things and you're still struggling, please seek therapy because a lot of a lot of us are having difficulty still adjusting a year later. Um, some of us are handling better than others, but it's still an adjustment. A lot of life has been taken, it has been readjusted, it has been changed, um, but you're not alone. And that's the good thing that um, I, I want to reiterate um, and just let you know that we're all as a nation, you know, we're going to definitely get through this. Sit with it. So oftentimes we may overconsume alcohol, we may overconsume food, right? Because we're we're rushing to like numb our feelings or our emotions because we don't want to be uncomfortable. But as a human, we go through so many emotions in a day. And I am I'm pretty sure as Dr. Val are giving you permission to say like, hey, it's okay if you're angry. It's yes. okay if you're disappointed. It's okay if you're yes. anxious or depressed. Nobody has done a COVID before. Nobody has done a pandemic, right? So it's okay if you cycle through these emotions, you know, during a week or, you know, during a day. I was okay like the first 90 days, but by June, I was I was losing my mind. I was like, oh my gosh, this thing is really serious and we're going to be in this pandemic for a while. And so you want yourself, you want your body rather, your physical self to feel alive by checking in to just identify how you're feeling. And if you're numbing yourself, you're not allowing yourself to be human and to feel because to feel is to be human. And just be honest with yourself. You don't necessarily have to share it with somebody who may not respect your vulnerability, who may make you feel bad. Because remember, we talked about that socially around, you know, setting those self boundaries and not being around people who can't handle your vulnerability. But if it's just sharing it with your journal or a therapist, then do that. But be honest. And you want to notice where these feelings in your body, you know, are showing up because we also broke down how it can be digestive issues. It can be headaches. It could be memory loss. Right. So again, when we're doing the assessment and we're realizing where these emotions are sitting within our body and where they are, we can literally go in and target right those areas and implement self care that will leave us rejuvenated and recharged. So our last question of today's webinar. Which targeted self care 
do you think you will struggle with implementing? We have setting self boundaries, a daily routine, turning off, shutting down, creating positive experiences, being cautious and not fearful, or sitting with it. Now, these are all pretty tough, right? And this is not something that you have to figure out literally on the spot today, but these are these are all ideas and food for thought so you can understand what it looks like, how you can use the information to really begin to think about self-care in such a targeted way that's going to help you, the individual. And so like any habit, you want to continue to work through them, right? 30 days, 60 days, you may find something works better than the other, right? But the, the main point of it is that you want to get in a habit of practicing targeted self-care um, for you. Okay, we're going to let this poll go for about a minute longer. So please get your answers in if you haven't already. Okay, so it looks like setting self boundaries. I can understand that. Uh, um, the concept of self boundaries is new for some people, right? Um, but I'm glad that you're here and you're learning about it, right? And so you can walk away again with that information and start to implement. Um, second is shutting down. It can be hard. It really, really can be. It really can be. But like anything, you just, you know, you take it one day at a time and to implement, you know, what that practice is so that it becomes easier for you, you know, um, as you progress uh, to implement that. And then third, we have turning off. Yes. So they're kind of like one and the same. Again, just taking it one one night, one morning at a time and just implementing, you know, those different um, tools and things that we laid out. Again, thank you guys for participating in the poll and sharing and being um, vulnerable with us. We really appreciate it um, because we know that um, self-care is something of a buzzword, but I really, and Dr. Val does to take self-care very serious. And if we don't practice it in some regard, we are doing a lot of damage to ourselves and people who are like in our circle. And so we want to be able to, you know, enjoy and be present. And although it was hard during a pandemic, we can do these things that are free, that doesn't cost a lot, doesn't require a lot. And so we just want to encourage you to be stingy, be selfish, you know, put yourself first. And it can be hard, but again, with anything, if you just practice it, you can definitely do it. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Val to close us out. Thank you so much, Dr. Holly. I appreciate it. So we've taken you through a whirlwind of information here, and we want to wind down with making sure that we review some of the key takeaways that we hope will resonate with you guys as we wrap this up today. So our first key takeaway from this whole presentation, 
make sure that you are checking in with yourself and asking yourself questions as it goes to this PEMS model to assess for specific areas to target and implement your self-care. Again, you've got to be able to check in with yourself, as Dr. Holly was just saying, and take it one day at a time while you're learning how to do this, because most of us have not thought about this in an intentional way. And so this is going to take some practice in order for you to start to get it right and start to feel like you can really see that it's working. So make sure that you're doing a regular check-in with yourself and really asking the questions on all of the areas, all of the levels of the PEMS model so that you can truly assess for what's going on in all those areas and then really implement some great self-care. We tend to implement self-care in areas that don't recharge or rejuvenate ourselves. So again, as you're looking at those untargeted patterns of self-care that you've had in the past, think about whether those activities actually rejuvenate you. As Dr. Holly said, you can spend hours on social media just mindless, mindlessly scrolling, but if you're not feeling any relief, any joy out of that, it's just filling your head up with more stuff, more stress stuff, it's not actually helping you. So be intentional about implementing self-care in the areas where you know what you're currently doing really isn't giving you the boost that you need. Be intentional about that, making sure that you're recharging and rejuvenating yourself in areas and ways that really give you what you need. Next takeaway, <clears throat> excuse me, is looking at untargeted self-care and how it can impact your relationships, your business, and your overall health. Again, the mani pedis, the bubble baths, those are things that most of us are all doing in some way, shape, or fashion now. And although they may feel good, as Dr. Holly said, the bubble baths, it's hygienic. So of course you're cleaning yourself and that's wonderful, but you should be doing that anyway. You really wanna make sure that when you're looking at how you're gonna transition into targeted self-care, that you understand the toll that untargeted self-care is taking on your relationships, your business, and your health. If you're really not taking good care, good care of yourself, you are noticing that after you do this assessment, you will see the areas that you're not doing well in. Make sure that you spend some time figuring out a game plan for how you can make sure that you are now making a more targeted impact or plan to impact those areas. Setting boundaries with others and yourself is key. Again, self boundaries as well as boundaries with the external world world are huge. If you can learn to do that for yourself, the benefits of that will go well beyond just your, your targeted self-care for yourself. They will manifest themselves in all areas of your life. You will feel much better about how you manage your time and folks will definitely appreciate your time when, when you give it to them they know that you truly want to be there. How many of us have said yes to things? And as soon as we say yes, we're like, oh man, I can't believe I said yes to that. I don't want to have to do it. So when you say yes and you mean it, that will show when you show up for whatever the activity, whomever the person is, setting those boundaries gives you the opportunity to truly be fully wholeheartedly invested in whatever it is that you say yes to. And folks will respect your no when you say no as well. But you've got to practice these things. This takes time. You're not going to get off of here today and be like, oh my God, everything's great. So make sure that you're looking at how untargeted self-care is impacting your relationships in a, in a negative way, your business in a negative way, and your health in a negative way, and practicing setting your boundaries with yourself and with others. If you can do these four takeaways that we've been talking about here, I think you will find that what you've sat through for the last hour and a half or so will really, really be a positive change in your life. So we wanted to end with giving you guys some resources so that you have an opportunity to not just think about what we've said and maybe you've taken notes, but you didn't get everything that we talked about today. We wanted to make sure that we left you guys with some resources so that you can, you can continue this journey on your own and look at some ways to get more involved and go more in depth in your work with this. So we've got a few books here. First one is the A to Z Self-Care Handbook for Social Workers and Other Helping Professionals. The second one is the Resilient Practitioner, Burnout and Compassion Fatigue Prevention and Self-Care Strategies for the Helping Professions. And then the third book, Self-Care for the Healthcare Professional, How to Gain Confidence, Take Control, and Have a Balanced and Successful Career. In terms of products, 
Dr. Holly and I have both talked about using day timers and planners in order to try to get your self-care routine together. So self-care cards and planner is one, and we've got the website there that you can go to buy that one. And then is something in terms of, we talked about one of those targeted self-care projects for the mental aspect of this, a coloring book. We all colored at one point when we were kids. Well, welcome to the world of adult coloring books now. It is something nice to get into. It's fun. It's something enjoyable that you can do for yourself that really will give your mind a chance to just take a break and reset. So we put down a, a resource for a mindfulness coloring book. And so we've got books, we've got products here for you guys as well in terms of resources. We want to thank you, thank you, thank you for all of your interaction, your support in coming today. Thank you so much. You've got our contact information here for Dr. Holly and for myself. Please find us on LinkedIn and connect with us. We would love to be able to talk with you moving forward. And if there's anything else that we can do in terms of assistance and help, we are here. So thank you, thank you again. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for your vulnerability and participating today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This concludes our presentation. Yes, thank yes. you everyone who has um, participated, who came onto the presentation um, to be in attendance with us. We really appreciate um, your feedback, your being here. And like Dr. Val said, please reach out to us on LinkedIn, connect with us. If you have any follow-up questions that may not get answered here today, feel, please feel free to reach out and email us. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Valerie and Dr. Holly. That was wonderful. I know I'll definitely be using some of that information myself. Um, so it is 128, but we had a few questions. I just want to be mindful of everyone's time, but would you be, we, there's only a few. Would you be willing to answer those? Okay. Um, sure. So first question, um, can you please talk to us about how you remain a nurturer to your family and friends while also setting boundaries? You want to go first, Val? Sure. Uh, um, I think Dr. Holly and I have talked about this. I think it's an ongoing struggle even for us to make sure that we're working at having good, healthy boundaries for ourselves while still being there for our family and friends. But it really is about valuing your yes as much as you value your no. And so Dr. Holly and I really, really work hard. And again, we talk about it a lot in terms of trying to make sure that we're consciously thinking about where do we want to give our time and our energy to? And that includes family and friends. You know, where do I want to give my time and energy to? And being honest with yourself, if you know you really don't have the time or the energy for in-depth, you know, girlfriend chat with somebody today, be honest and say that, hey, look, I'm not there today, but you know, give me a couple of days and I, I can be there for you because I want to be able to give you my full self. So it's a constant battle for us too and a struggle to maintain a balance in that. But it's work. It's it's every day working at valuing your yes as much as you value your no. Mm, okay, so for me, I um, thrive on structures. So I make sure that <clears throat> for every three hours or so that my children are on the computer, they spend an hour off. I make sure that when they are finished with school, I time my activities around that. So we all take a walk together. Our walks are about 20, 30 minutes. Cell phones are not allowed. We have conversations. How was your day today? Did anything frustrate you in class? Because they are in Zoom. They're not face to face with their um, peers. My children are 12 and 14. Um, and so checking in with them and then they'll check in with me. Well, how was work today? Um, you know, how are you feeling? How did you sleep last night? Did you buy anything? So for me, I, I've been doing this for, with my children since they were three, but now I'm even more intentional and involved to say like, hey, how was your day today? And then spending that downtime and then allowing them to have downtimes with themselves that don't involve the screen or their telephone. Um, eating dinner together now that everybody's kind of like definitely in the house, making sure that we do activities um, together. And they don't have to be, again, expensive or huge, but it could just be me and my daughter cutting the onions together and then having a conversation and talking about a movie that she may be watched over the weekend. On Sundays is daughter and mommy day where we literally rotate movies where she pick one, I pick one and we watch and we chime in with each other. Um, but Bedtime is set at a, at a certain hour at a time. I make sure that we hug and we kiss, but again, just having those connections and those conversations because they're even more meaningful um, now. And so as far as my friends and family, 
Um, my mom lives in Florida, so she she's a little bit more freer than we are in Pennsylvania, but we do FaceTime, we text, the same thing with my brother. Um, and when I can travel to states that are open, I definitely travel to see family and friends. But again, I do it in a safe space. I do believe in a vaccine, so I did get the shot. You know, unfortunately, my husband had COVID. We were not exposed, but just to be safe because my children, they're under 18 and they don't have the vaccine. So for me, again, it's about structure, implementing, you know, those times where we sit and we really do social things together. All right, thank you for answering that one. Um, and then we, so we had a few come in about the specific to the PEMS model. Okay. Um, so some folks were wondering where exactly they could find it. They There were questions asking if it was um, open to the public domain or if it's prop, proprietary restrictive. No, um, I actually, so the PEMS model was something that I created myself. Okay. It wasn't something that um, you can go and research and find is something that I created and coined right. myself because a lot of times when people think about self care, they only focus on one or two areas, either the physical and emotional or physical and mental. And I'm like, no, I'm a therapist and working in drug and alcohol and addictions. We want to treat the whole person. And a lot of times it falls into those five areas. And so from there is where I began to do more research about self-care and what areas people really only focus on. And it didn't include those five areas at all. But if you think about the human being, we need social interaction, right? Even if you don't have a religious affiliation, you have some type of you know spiritual grounding of some kind, of some sort, right? And we have brains, we have a, a lot of things mentally that we may have to process or go through physically. We are our bodies, our beings, right? Who are made up of thousands of emotions. And so again, that's just a holistic lens that I wanted to use when we think about self-care and just not from this physical aspect. Okay, um, would you possibly mind repeating again what PEN stands for, that was a question that came in as well. Yes, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, and social. Right. And um, there's one more question that just came in. So what can we do to repair the effects of COVID on relationships with a significant other? Um, I'm not sure what what's damaged. That was my question as well. Uh, we'd probably need a little more context. All right. Well, if that person would like to follow up through email, I believe we are definitely out of time. Um, <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Val and Dr. Holly, for such a great webinar. Um, this was really, uh, really great to listen to. And thank you, everyone, for your great questions. Um, I'm just going to go over a few more housekeeping items um, if anyone wants to stay on to listen to those. We would like to remind all participants that a recording of today's presentation will be uploaded to the webinar library located on IRETA's website by early next week. Once we have the recording posted, a link will be sent to all of today's webinar, webinar registrants. We have recently made some changes to the My IRETA profile page in order to ensure that we deliver quality webinars and presentations to our account holders. When you log into your My IRETA account, you will automatically land on your profile page, so we ask you to take a few moments to update your profile. I now want to remind you of our evaluation and CEU processes. You will receive several follow up emails from us. The 1st email will include a link to the evaluation and the 2nd email will include step by step instructions on how to obtain CEUs. Please note that it will take up to 48 hours for your CEUs to become available because we have to cross check your attendance records. We would like to specially request that you fill out our evaluation. It should take no longer than 2 minutes of your time. Again, we want to thank everyone for taking time out of your day to participate today. If you have any questions at all, please email us at info at And with that, I will conclude the webinar. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Dr. Holly and Dr. Val, and have a great afternoon. You too, thank you everyone. Thank you, bye-bye.